on the Halloween 1991 episode of Later with Bob Costas, Renaissance man Lou Gossett Jr. recounts his rich, rich, varied career. I mean, the guy was a kick-ass basketball player and left the very future NBA rich summer leagues around New York City to uh, join Broadway production of uh, Take a Giant Step. And uh, in retrospect, he made a great choice. I mean, the, as he, he talks about the, the lifespan of a basketball player is nothing compared to being an actor. And, and this guy wasn't just an actor, an athlete. He was a folk singer. He was a regular at Cafe Wa. Talks about who was funnier, Richard Pryor or Bill Cosby. And that Cosby knew that Pryor was much funnier. Uh, it talks about Jimi Hendrix being too loud for Cafe Wa and being released upon the world because of it. And uh, really cool, he talks about writing Handsome Johnny for Richie Havens. And when he was down and out, that royalty check, songwriting royalty check for Handsome Johnny showed up. And he talks about his role in Officer, the Gentleman, the Drill Sergeant, and it's so diverse from his character, but how he got into it. Talks about roots and uh, talks about slavery and his family's approach. And just really an impressive guy. So, great interview. Louis Gossett Jr. on Later with Bob Costas, October 31st, 1991. Thanks for staying up later. We're happy to have Lou Gossett Jr. with us tonight. And you know his basic credentials, the Oscar for Officer and a Gentleman, the Emmy for his role in Roots where he played Fiddler, the older slave friend to Kunta Kinte. And we'll get to that eventually, but let's talk about the things that people don't readily know mm -hmm. about Lou Gossett. How good a basketball player were you? I was pretty good, uh, but I kept interrupting my seasons with, with making money in theater and stuff. Um, I got a scholarship out of high school, but I had already done a Broadway show at the age of 15 and a half, 16 years old. Uh, the reason why I did that is that uh, I, was, I had a pretty promising career in high school, uh, but I was very skinny. So that summer, I got a job at Howard Johnson's. Had all I could eat. I eat five, six, seven times. My son does the same now. Eats all the time. And you know those clams and tartar sauce. You just oh, can't get boy, enough just, of them at, at Hojo's, Ice cream you know? and sandwiches. <laughs> I mean, I, I was a short order cook, so I, I put the food in my mouth, and I picked up something wrong, and I strained myself out for the first half of the season. My marks began to drop. My English teacher was Gustav Bloom, and he's a former Broadway producer director. He says, "Come do a play." So I did the play that weekend, had fun, recuperated, went back to basketball. And uh, Gus Bloom says, they're looking for a young black kid to play a lead in a Broadway show called Take a Giant Step. They can't find anybody in the business or they're going to the high schools. Tell your mother to, to take you down there, right? So that's how I got into show business. But I figured that was just an interim, just in case I didn't get a scholarship to college. I'd have some money. But I got a scholarship to college, a drama and an athletic scholarship, and I made the trip from Coney Island to 181st Street and Burnside Avenue and to Washington Square every day because I wanted to play basketball. Speaking of Coney Island, since you brought it up, did uh, I hear you say someplace that you once were a waiter or a guy behind the, the counter at Nathan's? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, all the kids that, that grew up in Coney Island got all those jobs, you know, Cyclone, Steeplechase, uh, Howard Johnson's, Nathan's. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Hebrew National. I was the champion of Hebrew National. <laughs> uh, so uh, th that set up my desire to play basketball was quite serious, but it kept being interrupted by television shows and, and movies, and I would take leaves of absence from NYU. And then finally, I played in the Summer League, the Rucker Tournament, yeah. and I played against a lot of pros there, and I was there I was invited to the Knicks training camp. And what happened? Uh, I was doing pretty good, and then I kept making the cuts, and I got a couple of elbows on the side of the head and a couple of knees to the back, and I was sitting there nursing my wounds, and I said, you know what? I definitely have a part in A Raisin in the Sun with Sidney Poitier, or I might get the last job on sit on the bench for the entire season. So I think I'm going to go and introduce myself to Sidney Poitier and say, I'm joining you, because I did, I, I'd lost the eye of the tiger. I'd lost, I, was, I stopped being hungry. 
This production of uh, Raisin in the Sun that you, that you mentioned, this is a stage production? Yeah, this is a Broadway or? production with Sidney Poitier and Claudia McNeil and uh, the late Diana Sands, Ruby D. And I, I did the original uh, film, too. Now, how does it compare? You play in the Rucker League, you mentioned, uh, which yeah. for people outside New York, this is a really prestigious summer league yeah. where the quality of play in many instances is as good as an NBA game. Sometimes there are legendary better. guys down there. Sometimes better. Guys who are in, NBA, in the NBA already come down to sharpen mm -hmm. their games during the summer. How does looking eyeball to eyeball at an NBA player compare in terms of the awe it inspires with looking eyeball to eyeball at Sidney Poitier? It's the same. It's the same. Uh, Looking eyeball to eyeball with Sidney Poitier is like playing tennis with a good tennis player. You get better. You look eyeball to eyeball with a great basketball player, if you have your fundamentals, you get better. Your thought process, your reactions, your reflexes have to be equal to the person you're playing with or against, and you, it, your game gets raised. It's the same. Yeah? If you had your druthers, mm -hmm. if you could have been an NBA All-Star, an Oscar-winning actor, which you are, or if you could have continued your career as a musical performer, <laughs> which one would have satisfied you the most? The way I think about it, I think I would probably would have been most satisfied by doing a one, an in one, they call it, performance in concerts with the guitar, with there's dramatic readings, it's a whole kind of show. I had got a great deal of satisfaction in the concert area. Um, at the time, I thought it was going to be, it, it has been acting, but the most satisfaction, to be honest with you, is the one-on-one, -on -one, with a guitar sitting on the side, and the stool, and the microphone, and the musicians behind me uh, sometimes. I think I've gotten more satisfaction out, out of that than even some films, with the exception of maybe Officer and Gentleman and Enemy Mine and stuff like that. How would you categorize yourself as a musician? You did a lot of folk-tinged material, right? I was right? a folk singer. You know, I'm not a, a crooner. I was, I was a folk singer, and the songs had messages. Uh, the song I wrote uh, gave to Richie Havens. Handsome Johnny. Handsome Johnny. It kept me from being evicted when I said, well, okay, I'm going to put the guitar down and go to California. And uh, I was being evicted. The day I was being evicted, it was the day the residual check followed me to Laurel Canyon. And it was $11,575.23. Uh, and, and you were flat broke. I was flat broke. I broke. I had my mother's couches and chairs on a 45 degree angle street, 8510 Ridpath Drive, and uh, some of the stuff was going down this S curve all the way down to Laurel Canyon Boulevard. You and know. the guy literally arrives, the mailman arrives. He and arrives says, and I showed the landlord the check, and he got in his car and got my stuff down the street and helped put the stuff back in. A lot of people probably remember this song, which Richie Havens sang. Mm -hmm. uh, it was almost an anthem of yeah. that period mm -hmm. of time. Yeah. Anti-war, countercultural, yeah. youth movement, mm -hmm. uh, about all the handsome Johnnies. All the handsome history, Johnny marching off blindly to with war. With a different weapon. With a different weapon. The flintlock, the musket, the M1, the AR, the, you know, the, the missile, the guided missile. Your path, I'm told, crossed with Dylan. Oh, yeah. With Jimi Hendrix? You mean Bobby Zimmerman. Yeah, Bobby Zimmerman from some, <laughs> someplace in Minnesota, right? Hibbing, yeah. Hibbing Minnesota, is yeah. it? Yeah. I had this wonderful Martin guitar, and uh, I ran the hootenanny down in the, the Cafe Wa, which is a fairly famous hootenanny. Yeah. Uh, we gathered a lot of money in that big straw basket. I had this very sexy girl with a black turtleneck sweater, you know, the beatnik look and the uh -huh. black jeans and, and the flamenco boots, and that basket would be full in about an hour and a half. So through there came Richie, Richie uh, Pryor and uh, Cosby and Godfrey Cambridge and Bobby Zimmerman and uh, Mama Cass and Mary Travers and Peter Yarrow, uh, Paul Stuckey, Noel Stuckey. He was my partner. So when I went off, he started to run it. And the people that went through that basement cafe in three years framed American music. What did Jimi Hendrix sound like in a noisy. basement? Too noisy. <laughs> they, Man, <laughs> they put him out of town, so he went where he could play and grow, and uh, the rest is history. Who was funnier, Richard Pryor or Bill Cosby? Richard Pryor, hands down. Did Cosby know it? Yeah, still does. <laughs> how did yeah. he? How did he cope with it? If that's the right word. Uh, he coped with it. Uh, he saluted him. Uh, Richard Pryor at that time was so devastatingly brilliant. Um, 
and he was trying out his new act in the village, and he was doing the standard comic act in, in the, at the, the Apollo and the different clubs, uh, his imitations, you know, like a comic would do. Yeah. Here's my impression. But he would try out his new stuff in the coffee shops, and that's where he was hilariously social statement brilliant. And Cosby was kind of in the middle, and I think Cosby almost began to talk like Richard for a while. All comics did. All, everybody in Richard Pryor's presence in that society would quote him because it was so right to say it that way. Um, he had a great impact on everyone, including Cosby. He had an ability at his best yeah. prior to combine a humanity that mm -hmm. wasn't forced in any way, a yeah. humanity and a social commentary, and simultaneously be so funny oh, that, hilarious. you know, people say, I laughed till my sides hurt, I laughed till I cried, I fell off the chair. That's BS in most cases. In his case, it was true. That man sent me to a hospital one night. I sat in the front row, and he invited me, and he wanted me to see his new routine, and I got a stitch. I, I literally got a stitch, and I had to leave, and I had to go to the hospital. It was a stitch in my side. I could not breathe. I could not laugh anymore. It was a brand new routine. He gave me a stitch in the side. <laughs> We're back with Lou Gossett after this. We told this story before, but it was such a popular film, and some people probably haven't heard it, about how you got into the role of the drill instructor in Officer and a Gentleman, how you prepared yourself. Well, I... Um, well, in order to get the role, that was the first thing. My agent, uh, the late Ed Bondi, God rest his soul, he's watching me every day. He's a New York agent. I remember him when he was 19. He saw Take a Giant Step. So to make a long story short, he became my agent, and it was 19-year wonderful friendship. And we said, hey, this is a Marine DI, and there's so many parts here that they don't call black actors for. Let's pick this one, and we're going to roast them. We're going to tell them, how come Lou can't play this part? And we built up this head of steam. They said, tell them to come in. And I knocked on the door, and Taylor Hackford said, you got the part. And all the steam went out, went out of my body. So now I've got the part, and I said, now what, now what am I going to do? I've got to be a DI. So I went down to San Diego, MCRD. That's Marine Corps Recruitment Division. That's where the DI school is. And it was run by the man who did the light beer commercials. How come you guys don't write? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Bill Dower. Little, little guy, short little, guy, little right? Powerful guy, yeah, yeah with a, a Baptist preacher's voice. And uh, I, I met him, and I said, uh, here's what I'm doing. I'm doing a movie and stuff, and uh, I'd like to learn how to be a DI. i got to do it right. It's a big shot for me. So he looked at me, and he smiled. <laughs> and he called some of these, about five or six of the guys, and he said, this man wants to be a DI, and he's doing a movie, and he's all yours. And they said, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> And that was the first day, the second day, the third day, the first week and a half was a hell. Uh, they woke me up when I didn't want to wake up, 4.30 in the morning. I had to stay at a motel off the base. And they put me back in bed at 9.30 at night. And then finally, it started getting good to me. And I started getting whatever that was they had, the essence. You just ignore pain. You just ignore everything. You are tough. It's a mentality. And it started to get me by osmosis. I did everything but smoke the camels and drink the beer. The hardest thing to do was the cadences. And that's how I did that, uh, that's how I got that role and did it. Was your DI tougher for dramatic purposes or were these guys every bit as tough, every bit as abusive as what you put on screen? Uh, I was pretty tough, but they cut some stuff that I learned, I got from those guys. So I wasn't as tough as they, they can't be that tough now, this law against it. Uh, but they taught me it all. You were a frustrated man for a while after Officer and a gentleman, and the yeah. tremendous success that you enjoyed there, because you thought mm -hmm. this would open it all up for you, and it didn't happen that way. That's what everybody dreams, you know. Uh, even the ones who dream about being the movie star, the, the, the little kids, when they dream about making it to Hollywood and getting the Oscar, all oh, the heavens are supposed to open up, you know. And that was in my mind because all my contemporaries had the same dream. We shared the same uh, dream. And it was a microcosm, I guess, of some Americans of all colors who share the dreams of those who do get that. And they, they make it to that particular place. And I share that frustration with some athletes, some coaches, uh, some people in music and, you know, uh, in other walks of life who might be people, men and women of color, who, oh, I've made it. I've won this award. And now why isn't the, the clouds opening? And... Uh, there are obvious reasons why, because uh, the unpreparedness of the industry to, to, to say, oh, here's the scripts we've been waiting for you. Mm -hmm. They had to kind of get it together.
to find scripts. The only thing they could find was a, maybe a television series of Officer and Gentleman. What do you want to do? What, well, we, we don't have anything, you know. It's a very frustrating period of time. How much overt racism do you feel still exists in Hollywood? And how much of it is a lack of sensitivity or an institutionalized kind of thing where basically they're saying, we're trying to make movies with the greatest possible appeal. So the black guy can be the best friend. But the guy who gets the girl has to be the white guy simply because more white guys are going to buy the tickets and they're going to identify with him. Well, it's all of that. It's all of that. And if I'm a white producer and I've been uh, successful and I've been in Hollywood for 20 years, I'm not going to back up so a black guy can take that part or take that uh, job. He's going to have to force his way in there and stand and, 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 and uh, des he, uh, there's a lot who deserve that, but he's going to have to do it on his own, his merit. He's trying to get into the business that uh, was set up by a lot of people. It's, it's been one way for a lot of years, and it's not going to happen like that. The minorities are going to have to find their own niche, support it, connect it with their audience, make it economical. And if it's economically feasible, and it is, because uh, we, have, we are uh, equivalent to the seventh largest country, our buying power, is equivalent to the seventh largest country in the world. If we could organize our buyers and our creative force, we could do that in about a week. That's easier said than done. So we should not get upset at a somewhat racist inst institution that we're trying to get there. We're just arriving. We have to bring ours with us and have uh, and, and deal from a, power, a position of power. And then we are worth something. If I do a movie and it makes millions of dollars, then everybody wants to do business with me. Mm -hmm. I think that's the name of the game. When you see Spike and yeah. John Singleton and Mario yeah. Van Peebles and people like that. Uh, they're making money. You're heartened by that, obviously. Yeah. They've made a wedge in the business. We need some decision makers, but we need to prove it. We need to, bring, we need to operate from a position of power and not with our hands and our palms up saying, you owe us, give me, give me, because it's not that kind of business. Thank you for the role of Anwar Sadat, the slain Egyptian leader in that miniseries. They gave um, Mrs. Sadat a list of names. On the list of names was Dustin Hoffman, Omar Sharif, two or three others, and apparently her husband had a videotape library. And I had, she, he had a lot of my stuff, and he sought it out. He sought James Earl Jones stuff out, my stuff, Sidney Poitier's, you know. But I was one of his favorites, which gives him goose pimples today, because he was definitely one of my favorites. The man had a spirit and a kind of a charisma. I watched him change his life. It was like a movie. Um, I had the decisions he made about being a man of peace from being a man of war because he lost his brother and his friends. Mm -hmm. I saw that change. I felt that change. Your role in Roots mm -hmm. as Fiddler, what did you draw on? Great-grandmother and my family on my mother's side. Uh, full, rich, alive, humor, strong people. Great-grandmother, the matriarch, approximately, she was approximately 115, 116 when she died. It was her role as the matriarch in the family and all the older women, her daughters and their sisters and cousins, to raise the children. The younger men and women had two, sometimes three jobs apiece a day. Domestics, porters, chauffeurs, newspaper men. Uh, you know, they had to put it all together. <clears throat> we lived in a 10 block radius. So we were shipped to, to a great grandmother's. She cooked, cleaned, chastised us all by hand and uh, ran, the, ran uh, a realm of sometimes 35 and 40 of my cousins, brothers and sisters and stuff. Where was this? Sheepshead Bay. We all lived in Brighton Beach, Bay Ridge, Coney Island, uh, Sheepshead Bay, Bath Beach, Canarsie, and we all would go to great grandma's house, Grandma Ray, mm -hmm. and we'd sleep head to toe, head to toe, some on the floor. We had a ball, had a ball. And she, uh, when she was got soft-spoken, that's when the fear of God was in us. We learned all the things we needed to learn to grow up from that woman. And when the youngest cousin got old enough to get married and moved to Long Island, she went to bed with a cold and never woke up. Was there any slave history that could be traced in, in your family? I believe she must have been a slave when Lincoln freed the slaves. Our record started with a Bible, and the Bible started the day we were freed. And she kind of remembers that. Remembered, past tense.